let's have a panel discussion on FMCG 2.0. The dialogue would be largely focused on how, as a brand leader and omni-channel retailer, the FMCG brands are adopting the inevitable transition to micro-fulfillment and determining how to infuse the brand into an experience that emphasizes customer. What could be the new normal? So please put your hands together for K. Radhakrishnan, the director and co-founder of Tata Star Quick. And let's welcome Rahul Gandhi, the CMO of ID Fresh Foods. And our moderator for this panel is Punita Sabarbal, the deputy editor of Entrepreneur India, to kindly join us onto the dais. The stage is all yours for the panel discussion. Thank you. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we won't keep you waiting much between lunch and the discussion, but uh, it's an interesting panel we have put together for food and grocery. And it's going to give you some interesting food for thought. And uh, today on the panel, I have two interesting people, one representing a brand and uh, another one representing uh, the new age commerce plus the omni-channel retail, which we have seen so far. So in the last two years, we have seen the kind of transformation food and grocery has gone through. So I'll just get into the discussion mode with the two gentlemen here and talk about how Omnichannel and uh, being relatable with the customer has become more prominent and uh, become the talk of the town today. So, Mr. Radhakrishnan, I would first come to you and understand because uh, there is Tata uh, Star Retail also present, and plus we also have uh, Tata Star Square, which you represent. So, how both of them merge together and then look after the customer, and in the last two years of COVID. How has it served the new age consumers which we see now? Um, I think the COVID has almost become a cliche now, right? So what, what should have happened in five years is really happened in the last uh, 24 months. Uh, Star Bazaar is a, is a prominent uh, grocery retailer. We are really a good value uh, retailer uh, across India. Um, Five years ago, we started this journey where we thought that the customers will, in 2017, we could sense that the customer wants to shop online as well. And it was the belief uh, of the group that omni-channel would be the way that we should go. We have stores and customers not going to shop only at a store. They will shop online, they will come to the store, they may switch from one to the other. We have found that um, the customers who shop offline and online, their average bill values are 20% higher than if they were shopping completely online or completely offline. What we've been able to do also is that the online uh, business, 70% of the customers who shop with us actually don't shop at the store, which means that we've brought the footprint um, to the store because we are an omni-channel. Omni-channel means we don't have the stock on our own. We, online starts where offline stops. So picking the stock from the store and delivering within eight kilometer radius of the store is what really omni-channel is. I'll come back to you for more. So Rahul, uh, with regards to the ID Fresh brand, uh, I mean, when COVID happened as a brand, how did you reach out to your customer? Did online sales become more? Yeah, so I, I think as marketeers, we always tend to measure customer's behavior and then have marketing activities and distribution platforms aligning to customer behavior. So like uh, uh, Mr. Radhakrishnan was saying, if the customer is offline, we are offline with the communication. If the customer is online, we are online. If the customer wants to do meta tomorrow, we'll do meta. Yeah. Uh, so um, 
that way we are in a way always mirroring our marketing and distribution activities to mimic the customer behavior. And we all know that during the pandemic, the customer did not have an option to go offline anywhere. There was initial three, four months where everything was shut down. You were one member per family and all were going out. So everything had moved online. So the obvious thing to do there was to move your spends online. Now, ID, unfortunately, does not have its own uh, D2C platform. Yeah, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, we are delivering a five day, seven day shelf life product, yeah, which is of a unit value of 75, 100 rupees. And unit economics don't make sense there. Yeah, and anyway, D2C. Uh, brands, I mean, there was a lot of pickup of D2C brands uh, in the first six to 12 months of the pandemic. And then e commerce channels, of course, like Big Basket, Swiggy, and Dunzo picked up a lot. So um, we did not have anywhere to spend on um, uh, D2C. So we ended up spending our monies on e com platform. In fact, uh, Big Basket and ID formed a partnership, a co branded partnership, and so on and so forth. So we were spending our money there. Now, in the last six to eight months, that business has started moving to quick commerce. So within the two years of pandemic, you've actually had a D2C search, a mainline e-commerce search, a quick commerce search. And now the businesses are kind of plateauing and going back to the modern trade and general trade channels because the consumers are moving out. It's like we are having a physical event today. Yeah, it's possibly the second or the third physical event. So uh, how did ID do? ID is mimicking where the consumer is. Yeah, and uh, the uh, consumer behavior has been very dynamic. Yeah, uh, uh, usually in two years, consumers Bit switch between channels or communication platforms, not so high. So we've had to be a bit more agile than usual, but the in principle, just following what the consumer is doing. Sure. Um, so when both of you talk about omni-channel becoming the norm and the new normal, uh, going forward, what kind of a percentage shift or divide do you see in terms of customers going online and buying through offline domain? I think it's too early to say. Um, and uh, I'm not sure the customer has made up its mind about the way it has to be. The channel itself, buying online grocery itself, is new to the customer as yet. Customer has to get more familiar with it. Uh, but very clearly, we have seen that of the customers who shop with us, um, in a dipstick that we did, about 50% of them don't shop at the store at all. They've shifted totally and totally. And uh, I would suspect that the age group of that customer is a little different. That they are maybe between 27 and 35, 40, who have done that total shift. The people who are, uh, you know, 45 plus still would like to go to the store and do their shopping. Grocery is not homogeneous. There are, we have product which is at uh, minus 23 degrees. We got chill products. We got ID, which where the temperature of the product has to be kept chill, and that has to be delivered chill. So there are four temperature zones. And therefore, the handling of that is very critical. So online, for the quick commerce, it makes sense to be ordering your frozen and chill with a 20-minute delivery. Mm -hmm. But you may do your monthly shopping uh, where you want to save on price, yeah. where the perishability is uh, not a factor. You may want to do it at a, on a different occasion, buy a larger basket and get it home delivered you don't have to cut all this on your own. It gets delivered at your doorstep. So I think the, the people are still experimenting with this, um, with this mode. Um, but today the customer is in really a very good spot. They can buy in 15 minutes, they can buy in three hours, they can buy same day, they can buy next day, they can buy next week. Grocery can be delivered in so many different ways. I think the retailers now have to do their work well where how do you deliver really a product in the right way to the, to the customer. In our company, we say that jis din ice cream kadak doorstep pe deliver karoge, us din aapka supply chain thik hua. Sure. So just to add to it, I mean, does it also put a question mark on the popularity and profitability of the brand when customer is only seeking discounts, whether through online or offline grocery and food shopping? Yeah, I think the last uh, 10 years that 
Well, I started off as a startup myself. Um, started this business. Uh, so I know what a, what a startup life is. And I've always wondered how, what's the skill required to raise a hundred million dollars which you can burn in two years without having to be accountable for it. That's a very nice situation to be in. You can burn so much of money, uh, don't have to answer anybody. The only question is how fast are you burning, right? Uh, I'm not sure I want to be there. Uh, the reason we chose Omni Channel is also because we want to do it in a manner that, that the glide path to profitability is clear enough. Because uh, my 10-year-old son can burn $60 million in one year. So there is no Mardangi in losing $100 million in a couple of years. Can you make money? Do you have a trend which is showing that you can make money? That is the question to ask. And I think over the last two years, this is now going to become a reality. I was reading an article in the paper the other day that the fundings may start drying up. Yeah. But you know, that cycle we have seen up and down where you had a dot-com boom, everybody started looking at profitability, then again you have money coming in, people, you know, spent so much of money. Uh, so profitability should be the key word which will determine who will survive and who won't. Sure. Rahul, coming to you, because you had marketing at ID Fresh, and then uh, when you got into uh, uh, omni-channel mode, whether the, when the brand is selling through online and offline, is there a question mark again, the same question to you, in terms of how popular you want to go take the brand, and uh, will profitability be questionable in that case? Yeah, interesting questions you ask. One is on you know how popular you want to make the brand, and the second one is on profitability. So, um, for any brand which wants to say, uh, you know, be the dominant brand in uh, Star Bazaar, yeah, if ID wants to be hypothetically the most dominant brand on Star Bazaar uh, across India, yeah, in all stores, it is actually a pretty tough task to do because you need to move things around in physically in stores. Yeah, you possibly need to be at the checkout counter, in the chiller, on the walls, on the trolleys, everywhere. Yeah. Now, if I want to be um, the most visible brand on a e-com platform, let's take Zepto, for example. Yeah, I can, um, possibly it's a far easier job. I can ask my graphics team to get the homepage design done, take three carousels and the L1 category banners, and take all the search keywords. It does require a bit of cash burn. But uh, being dominant in e-commerce for a brand is much easier because it doesn't require physical movement of stuff. So um, we, everybody realizes that, we also realize that, and uh, when the consumer shift was happening to e-commerce, we also doubled up our investment in e-commerce. So uh, to your question of how popular the brand should be, um, maybe it is easier to make the brand popular by using a mix which is heavy on e-commerce and digital because physical movement of stuff is not required there. Yeah. Yeah, just because of that reason. Uh, maybe it is more expensive. Now coming to the second part of profitability. So we were actually analyzing the other day, you know, dairy is a pretty tough business to make money in for every anyone and we are into the dairy portfolio also. We have paneer and curd apart from the idli, dosa, batter and paranta as our mainstays and uh, we were wondering what is the channel wise profitability of paneer in e-commerce versus general trade. It's And um, you know, the returns that we are getting from e-commerce usually are one-fifth the returns that you'll get from GT and modern trade. Yeah? So putting up a ballpark number, if you're getting 15% returns from general trade, mm -hmm. you're getting 3% from e-commerce. Okay. Yeah, 20%. So you save 12% straight in the profitability. Yeah? And uh, now what happens is that uh, then you, and this is primarily because e-commerce is made to order. You know, you, they give you a PO and you supply and there's no inventory. You know, they, they're doing it any day, whereas any retail store is carrying seven to 15 day of inventory, even for a, you know, a longish shelf life or a chilled product. So, but e-commerce is apparently running on discounts, which is 10 to 12 percent again. Yeah, and that way GT and general trade and e-commerce tend to be kind of same in profitability with e-commerce being slightly easier to gain market share and trials in. So going forward, do you think uh, there will be a shift in mindset required with regards to the new capabilities which we are seeing 
evolving in the retail space? You mean the consumer mindset? Yeah. I mean, the consumer mindset is more or less, you know, uh, pretty much uh, solid all throughout this, what I believe, you know. They're looking for their own benefit and rightly so, we all are. Yeah, and the only two, three things that the consumers can spend is one is money, the other is time, and time includes convenience. Yeah. So these are the only two things, and what the consumer gains is the benefit that the product or the service gets you. Yeah, so that way, if the modern trade store is a better experience, yeah, then for a category, then they'll go to modern trade store because it's more beneficial. If the e commerce is on a higher discount, they'll go to e commerce. Yeah, so that way, consumers will primarily be looking at satisfying themselves by paying some inconvenience and paying some money. So that way, uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't think that we are really, mad. the only thing that I think in, in retail might happen is that the, at least for our category, you know, you need to be able to see the shelf life of yeah. the product for it to be, you know, nice to consume. And uh, I know uh, Flipkart, I think, has now started announce, uh, writing dates for the fresh products. So if you're ordering milk mm -hmm. and you receive milk which is expiring in w one day, you'd be like, no, I can't finish my whole two liters. So that is somewhere where, you know, physical stores still make a difference. The second thing is obviously an experience. You know, I was at a concert three days ago and the singer-songwriter who was on stage was saying, it was so nice to sing in front of real people, you know, instead of doing a live, uh, you know, a live stream. And I could understand what he's saying and that's why possibly the physical channels will never you know, move out because it will finally end up being an experience and if that experience is valuable, yeah, the consumer will pay a premium for it. Sure. Mr. Radhakrishnan, you have seen both sides of retail, I mean, offline, online, both. So now when the customer is largely moving online and retailers too, what challenges do you see in the current scenario, whether it's regards to supply chain or... I mean, having riders becoming a problem, I mean, what are the challenges, if you could mention? Um, uh, I think Ajoy said it in, uh, when he was talking that, you know, digital marketing is expensive business, right? And uh, when you have a physical store, you have actually an, uh, a marquee place where people see when they're mm -hmm. going past. Uh, but the traffic becoming such a problem has reduced the radius from which people are coming, and therefore e-commerce bolted onto a store actually makes money. Yeah. The challenges really are uh, shifting all the time. Mm -hmm. When fuel prices go up, that creates a problem. So the macro environment also um, creates some kind of issues. But the real problem is customer attention. It's not a problem, it's a challenge. It's part of their business. Um, getting new customers, if, if, you, if you are getting 40% of your next month's sale from new customers. Just imagine how many hundreds of rupees you've got to pay to get every new customer. Mm -hmm. And you're not able to ret retain them. Then what business are you in? And that's not, that's not, that's true not only of the uh, online, mm -hmm. also of the online, of, of, of the offline. If there are 10,000 customers who walk through your store in one month, how many of them come back and shop with you next month? How many are you able to retain? So, the biggest cost in the business is customer retention. Mm -hmm. And that, maybe through personalization, or maybe through better service, how do you create stickiness for that customer to come back is the largest challenge that, not only online, but offline, even any business is going to face, it's the same that we face as well. Rahul, if I could ask you, uh, I mean, uh, is customer acquisition cost, again, uh, do you think that's the biggest challenge as a brand you're also facing at the moment? Yeah, customer acquisition, I, uh, it's the biggest business imperative. Yeah, um, I mean, without acquiring of new customers, um, the brand cannot survive. Yeah, um, if you look at data of household penetration, and I was reading this in a book the other day that uh, some of the strongest brands, even with 70-80% market share, their primarily uh, marketing strategy revolves around how do we gain newer, lighter buyers. Yes. People who just come flirt with the brand, try and go out. And it's almost like, you know, you are um, adding small, small pieces of, or, or, or chunks of sand into a box and th that has to continue pouring in because a brand is a leaky bucket. There's a hole at the bottom where customers are moving out. That's retention. But, Rather was speaking about. 
So this entire process of people entering the brand and people exiting the brand, if it's in favor of people entering the brand, if 5 lakh people are entering, 3 lakh people are going out, yeah. your brand is growing. If it's the other way around, your brand is degrowing. So customer acquisition is uh, the inlet pipe, which has to continuously uh, be nurtured, and uh, that can be done by offering value to the consumer, which is, you know, a perceived value. I mean, people do many things for, for generating trials. You know, you build your brand, you run promos, and do and so on. And then finally, you have to keep the customer happy. Yeah, and for keeping the customer happy, it's actually no different than, you know, keeping a relationship happy. When, you know, you get married, then you have to celebrate anniversaries, and then you celebrate birthdays. Year in and year out, the relationship becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and after 20 years, you had a successful relationship. The brand also has to keep the customer happy. Yeah, it has to give up goodies every now and then, a nice piece of communication that touches your heart, great product, great service, great customer care, and the relationship nurtures. So um, that way, and that could be one, and that is also a very big challenge of uh, retaining customers because it's, customers can be hard to please. Uh, I must say, may, several years ago, I launched a brand called Sumeru. It's a frozen food brand. Uh, and I understand the challenges that you guys face. I'm a great fan of your product. It's one of the most difficult areas to be in. But the great advantage he has compared to what e-commerce does is that he actually has a design element to what he does. ID is a design. It is a, the uh, it's a product which is really made yeah. uh, from scratch, right? But a retailer doesn't actually particularly grocery. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about apparel mm -hmm. or jewelry. A uh, grocery retailer doesn't actually have a design element in his product. A grocery retailer's product is a service. Good. We buy, stock, and sell. You got to be damn good at doing that. Buy well, stock well, and sell well. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's the, the service is the biggest challenge. And, if, and therefore, it's all, almost, almost everything of that is virtual. The retailer has to understand the customer, it is data. Yeah. You've got to communicate, that's virtual. And then getting the customer back on a cycle, that is the big challenge. So grocery retailers in particular have this great challenge of retaining customers with a service which is almost ubiquitous, probably everybody has the same thing. How do you win in that market? Correct. And Rahul, uh, if you could also share in terms of some insights with regards to repeat customer ratio at uh, ID Fresh. The repeat customer ratio at ID Fresh. Oh, um, luckily touch wood. Yeah, it's quite good. Uh, uh, it, it depends upon whether the customer is satisfied with the brand or not. You know, it may be good today. It can go back tomorrow. As of right now, uh, we, we are no online retailers. You know, I was uh, hearing Zeno talking about all the kind of stuff that I want to do, but we are not able to do. But because we are purely an offline, mostly an offline brand, we don't have our own D2C. We are dependent on Swiggy Big Basket. So I won't be giving you hard data, but we're doing it the classical way through research. And our brand funnel seems to be pretty strong in most markets except uh, TN, yeah, uh, Tamil Nadu. And um, uh, that was... Um, uh, the brand funnel is a function of that if 10 people are trying your brand, how many are sticking to it? That's great, basically what customer retention is. Yeah. So as of right now, we are a good 75, 80. So if 10 people are trying, 8 people are sticking and buying it again, which is very healthy. Yeah. Uh, most people are trying brands saying, no, I'll never try it again. Yeah, I'll try something else. But maybe the customer is finding utility in what we're doing and I mean, we are finally selling a staple, so it's a very big market. And if we are able to deliver the staple, consistent quality at the right price, um, and as long as competition is not there, which currently is thankfully not there except in TN, uh, we have pretty 75-80% retention ratios. In TN, we didn't have it very high because I think we didn't have the pricing right. We just corrected the pricing last year, and hopefully the, those retention ratios should go up. So before we uh, throw open the floor for questions, just one last comment from both of you about one insight or future trend you could share about the food and grocery market in India. Uh, I think the food and grocery markets are only going to grow. Um, we have seen that food market really grows when people, um, during recessions, we've seen market grow. When there's some trouble, we've seen market grow as far as food is concerned, because they don't spend on other things. During the pandemic, we saw food consumption to be fantastic. The only thing is the channels were shut, and therefore the e-commerce really grew. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think the, um, uh, the food market, there are going to be several brands which are going to be launched as we, as we go. Uh, but the clutter and the ability to get to the customers, to find a space in the customer's mind, is going to be really a very big challenge. And that is where the food brands. And, and in India, because modern trade is still so small, the biggest challenge is distribution. Why, why, why are still some of the big brands continuing to be bigger and bigger? It's because the smaller brands find it so difficult to be able to cover a thousand towns. To get there is what the other brands have already done in the last 50, 60 years. Uh, so e-commerce is one way to actually break that, break that reach. And uh, e-commerce will have, I think, so many new brands which uh, will come to e-commerce uh, for a launch. Sure. Rahul, your final. Yeah, I, I just talk about food. I think uh, the one thing that we've been seeing in food for the last uh, many years is experimentation has been growing. Yeah, I know Nando's came with a peri-peri sauce maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, there was no peri-peri chicken with that. Yeah. I had a very nice um, chicken. I already had my lunch, by the way. I already had a very nice chicken in a mushroom sauce. And I was experimenting. And I see the same thing happening in branded package. Wing Greens is a fine example. Viva sauces is a fine example. All these experimentations, some of them are going to become mainstream, but this experimentation will continue. So that way, food is a very rare industry where you can actually create, the chefs in every hotel, you know, they can actually create a meal which you've never had before. There are very few industries that can do that, yeah. Yeah, where you can actually create product out of nothing just by a concoction of mixtures. So that has been increasing a lot, and uh, e-commerce and digital obviously the, yeah, are mediums for people to experiment, you know, people are, who are always experimenting irrespective of the price. They are, these on, they are uh, here on such channels. So that is something that in the last five ten years has been accelerating, and I see that, you know, is something that will possibly continue, it's just that we don't want to be misled by it because let's remember that finally the most selling thing on mo any e-com platform or any restaurant or inside a home will be chapati, rice, tandoori roti, chicken, dal, yeah, and those are things that have been genetically embedded by generations and Indians have grown on to it and that's why the Andhra idli is so different from the uh, Udupi idli. Yeah, and so those things will continue. So be mindful of experimentation while being aware that uh, finally the bulk of the market will consume what it has been consuming for many years. Sure. With this, the floor is now open for questions. Please raise your hand. I think the gentleman here has a question. Can we have the mic here, please? Okay. Uh, you can ask first. Uh, hello. So my name is Nalini, and I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Team Sweet Karam Coffee. Dot in, um, it's a D2C a brand promoting uh, homemade uh, uh, food products, and we ship across the globe. So being in the same segment, um, uh, my question is to Radha Krishnan, sir. Um, so in this uh, inflation times, and especially where you know there is a clutter of several uh, brands, you know, entering the food space. Uh, how do you maintain a balance? What is your advice to maintain a balance between, uh, you know, gaining that customer popularity versus the pro pro maintaining that profitability? So, how do you maximize or balance between, uh, you know, these two factors? What would be your suggestion? Yeah, um, way back in early part of my career, I, when I was a Unilever, we launched a brand called Top Ramen and Cup Noodle. It was a Japanese collaboration. Many of you must have. It's a popular brand today. So when we were doing that whole collaboration, the Japanese guys came to India and we, he said, I want to travel and see what kind of food is sold in India. So he was making his first trip to India. So starting from Kakeda restaurant in Delhi to Muniandi Villas in, in Tamil Nadu, we ate at so many restaurants and he spent considerable time in the toilet uh, while he ate all that food. But when he was making his report, and I'm talking about 1989, when he was making his report, he said, and he catalogued all the food that he had eaten, he said, how on earth am I going to sell noodles in this country? Because in one lifetime, you cannot finish sampling all the food of this country. But in spite of that, we launched, and Top Ramen is a reasonably good brand, and Maggie has now become like staple, right? It's my favorite. Yeah. 
Sure. So to answer your question, what I learned in that experience is, as far as food is concerned, there is no dearth of experimentation in food. Differentiation in that food, either in the form of the way it is made, for instance, ID is a, there is batter, the whole of South India is batter every day morning, but ID comes in a particular form to serve a particular purpose. That is differentiated. It's the same batter, maybe, well, there is not a single South Indian home which does not make its own batter, but then why are people buying ID? Because the moment you become time poor, then you may want to use that same thing in a, in a different form. So to answer your question, apply your mind on differentiation. It can be taste, it can be form, it can be time, or it can be the way you actually deliver it as a supply chain to the customer. It has got to be differentiated. Otherwise, you'll be battling for price and you won't make money. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here yeah. has a question. Uh, so my question is to uh, Rahul, sir. Uh, considering, sir, considering the nature of the product that ID uh, is in this, the shelf life and the overall sensitivity around it, uh, what steps uh, do you take to gather consumer intelligence uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the reviews or, uh, you know, even if it is like a few hours late or if somebody consumes it, like a, just a few hours late, the, you know, the entire taste can change and experience can change. So what are some steps you take to gather this consumer intelligence? Yeah, so uh, um, interestingly, you, you raise a very funny point. The, the, uh, last year, we were actually trying to coin what are the seven values of ID. And one of them was customer obsession. And we debated that value a lot, you know, internally as an organization as to why is customer obsession important for us. Yeah, finally, uh, in the food industry, food is one of those rare things that you actually put inside your body. Yeah, many things that you buy, you actually don't put inside your body. As much as I love my mobile phone, I shouldn't do that. Yeah, uh, uh, but uh, food is something that you put inside your body. And if you put the wrong kind of stuff inside your body, you can have severe health issues. Yeah. Uh, in a fresh product, which has no chemicals, no preservatives, emulsifier, or any such thing, we are as good as mama making it out of the kitchen and packing it in a box. It's just that we pack it in a laminate. Yeah? Uh, so what happens as a result is that if a fresh food brand is not obsessed with the customers, it's actually antithesis to the business. Because firstly, you're ingesting something, ingesting something which is without chemicals, preservatives, which means that if there are no chemical preservatives, the shelf life will be smaller. And if there is a chance of, you know, something going wrong, the whole thing becoming over-fermented, we are the industry where it's the highest chance. So hence, we all decided that customer obsession is a value which is very important for us. How do we do it, given that we are not omnichannel? And thank you, there's so much data nowadays. Yeah, Big Basket has some 12,000 ratings of ID batter. We can always listen to, uh, look at them. Amazon has a few thousand. And uh, customers are always writing in and calling us just the way they do to traditional marketeers. And honestly, I don't think there is, the dearth of data is something that uh, shies us from making decisions. You know, in the olden days, we used to do research with 30 consumers and say we'll get 90% confidence <laughs> results. You want 99% go to 200. Yeah. So we, uh, so we don't need millions and millions of data points to actually figure out a fairly simple problem. So we are able to gather this. And the other thing that, you know, uh, that we as a company do to listen to customer our uh, chief customer care officer was here in this. Um, uh, he's a, as your chief customer care officer, he's also the co-founder, PC Mustafa. He actually goes through every complaint on email himself. I don't know how he does it. I don't know why he does it. Yeah, I'm like, why do you do it? It must be taking so much time. But that's the customer obsession he has. And then he, you know, follow it up with the, you know, the customer care executives that have you closed the complaint. Yeah. And I think that's the obsession with which the brand has been built. And I think. Luckily, I don't know whether it was by design or by default or it was because of Mustafa's personality or something, but the fact is it really worked for a fresh food brand yeah, to, having, uh, to have customer obsession because if you don't have customer obsession, you eat something, your tummy is upset, your parotta has something or your bread has fungus, that's not going to work. You're going to be out of business. So I think uh, data points are all there. Um, we have to be able to listen to them and act upon them. That's, that's what's important. Sure. So with this, we have come to the end of this session. And in case there are any more questions, please feel, OK, we'll take just one last question, and we'll close the session then. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, we are into br a brand that deals in dry fruits. We have a brand by the name Granos. So my question is to you that uh, how do you make people believe that the product is really qualitative. 
because you are also selling you know a quality product and by online by selling online when in this field a customer cannot actually have the idea of the quality by just having a look look at the product you know it's very hard to make them believe yeah for you yeah. yeah sample it that's i mean that's how we do it uh, if you uh, that's how we do it i mean if your product is really good for example uh, we just launched frozen parottas in uae and we thought that the competition there was kavan which is a very big international player and uh, ifco and uh, i happened to go to uae i was like okay let's eat parottas today we cooked all competition parottas and we realized that our parotta was the tastiest what is the thing we do we sample it increase your marketing spend towards sampling maybe put the communication down a bit if you have to because you can just sell on product yeah so i think that be the if, if your dry fruit business is is delivering superior dry fruits than the competition brands then skew your marketing budget towards sampling yeah i think that'll be the nice okay okay, okay. thank you sure thank you we will now close the session thank you so much gentlemen for sharing such insights and paving the way for the future of food and grocery retail thank, thank you. you thank you thank you so much I request Punita Sabarwal to do the honor of presenting a token of thanks to both our panelists. Thank you so much.